Welcome everybody to the session of ROSI, the Robot Operating System in Erlang by Natalia Chechina and Luca Sushi. Okay, uh, we are glad that they could join us today. So without further delay, handing over to Natalia and Luca. Right, thank you, Shish. Um, so hello everybody. And um, so I'm Natalia, Natalia Chechina, and uh, we have Luca Succi, and we'll talk today about ROSI, which is Robot Operating System Integrating Erlang. And this work, we actually um, started in 2015, um, at the time I was a postdoc at Glasgow University, and then we sort of worked on the idea, tried why, um, uh, whether Erlang is actually a good fit for um, robotics. And uh, last year we collaborated with the uh, University of Milan and we took this initiative with Piers Gzinger and collaborated with the University of Milan, got funding from Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. You already heard about it from Francesca today and I'll just uh, say a couple of words later. And this project uh, began to leave. Uh, so I will start with who we are, and both Luca and myself were developers, and we both have uh, our past in um, academia. So I used to be um, an academic, I worked at Glasgow, Harriet Ward, and Bournemouth universities, and uh, Luca, he just recently graduated from the University of Milan. Um, so I'm a developer at Erlang Solutions and Luca is developer at PSG Gzinger Limited. Um, so ROSI, so what is ROSI? ROSI is about bringing scalability, fault tolerance, hot code swapping to the, uh, of the state of the art distributed systems into the open source robotics. Um, so the sort of first, uh, there, were, there will be a couple of questions that we'll be answering today before we jump into sort of explaining, um, Rosie explaining what exactly was done, demonstrating what it has today. And the first two questions are what we are dealing with, right? So what are robots? And the second question will be why do robot needs Rosie, right? Why, you know, life is, is not good without it. So what is a robot? Um, so the, the question is like, is, our, is my washing machine a robot, right? So what makes a robot? What distinguishes just a you know, computer or any sort of mechanism with uh, some of a processor in it or some board in it from, from a robot? And the answer is it has to have two things. It should uh, sense, and it should act. So if your washing machine can sense that you have unwashed laundry and it can load it and wash it and give it back to you, then it means your washing machine is a robot. Otherwise, I'm sorry to say, it's just a washing machine. Um, so the um, breadth and the sort of variety of robots, it's huge. And we have lots and lots of robots. We have humanoid robots, we have military robots, we have robots that, um, you know, focus on walking, on recognizing, on co communicating with humans, like huge variety of robots. And the types of robots that we are interested, these are complex robots, right? So it's not just, you know, like a very, you know, primitive, simple thing that you can, you know, code very quickly, like in a day or two, and it starts like moving around maybe. So we're interested in really complex robots that have multiple paths to them. Uh, for example, even legs, they're very complex. They have lots of joints. Um, they need to, you know, make sure that they stable, they're not falling anywhere and things like that. So um, they're capable of various things, right? So they not just, you know, move, hand, for example, uh, back and forward, but they can maybe lift things, you know, carry them around, so, or walk around even more, can see, can like with cameras, can hear with microphones, can speak with speakers, and then can move with some kind of joints and things like that. So we're interested in uh, 
very like light complex robot, very, very complex robot. Um, they are capable of communicating with various devices. So it's interesting because we'll talk about it that um, modern robotics, it's modular, right? So it has different components and then they communicate and this communication is very interesting to us. But um, ultimately what we want is a collection of robots, right? Doing something together. And when I'm talking about communication and robotics, communication means different things. So communication means communicating like humans, like you and I, for example, you see my emotions, you, you see my sort of hands movement, um, you hear me sort of talking and that's how we communicate. But um, what I mean by communication in robots is that um, they uh, send data to each other like machines, right? So it's not through their recognition of emotions that's uh, called uh, uh, collaborative robotics, but through uh, sort of some kind of machine data transfer, uh, which is more in the area of cooperative robotics. Um, and what we are out of scope, what we are not interested in are in primitive robots. It's not that we are completely not interested in that, but maybe there will be later some application of it, but at the moment it's sort of out of scope. We are not targeting. And for example, these swarm robotics, they're very primitive. Their, their behavior is about collection. So behavior emerges from primitive behavior of single elements. So for example, these robots, they can, for example, move only you know, forward, one step forward, right? But then when all of them start moving forward or part of them like stays and some move forward, we can see like this complex behavior emerging from just the swarm of them. So these are out of scope for us um, at the moment, at least. Um, so the next question, especially from those who work with distributed system is, well, why robots are different, right? Why can't we just, you know, use the breadth of knowledge that we have in distributed systems? We know how do fault tolerance, scalability, hot code swapping in distributed system. Is it really needs something new? Can we just, you know, reuse these mechanisms? And actually we need, we need to think a lot and we need to come up with new methods very specific to robots. And the reason for that, that first of all, communication is not stable. So when we think about a data center, for example, we think about very stable connections, right? So if connection fails, then there is a problem, right? Or for example, when we talk about a collection of computers in a room or in a building, there's still quite stable communication. They won't just lose it randomly, right? Every another second. So, and in robots, we have very unstable communication because they move all the time. They go out of range, they come back and things like that. Maybe the signal is not strong enough and all sorts of things. So we work in the environment when the communication fails all the time. Then we deal with limited resources, right? So depending on the type of robot, depending on what they do, we don't have like terabytes of memory. We don't have um, super powerful hundred core um, or you know millions of cores on or processors on the on the robot. But we make them some powerful, you know, eight core, um, 16 cores, 24 cores, whatever that is, but it won't be, you know, super powerful. That's just will be um, a computer with some resources. And usually these resources are not particularly enough. So the robot needs much more than it has. And the reason because it needs to move, it needs to be compact. So we need uh, to rely on these limited resources. Then li limited power. So when our data centers, they're just connected to the mains, we don't have this luxury. We have a battery, the battery have limited, and the more powerful uh, robot, the more powerful battery we have, the more energy it consumes. It's still, you know, it doesn't matter. We still don't have enough energy and we need to make sure that when uh, sort of the battery goes down, the performance remains the same. It's not that the battery goes down be beyond, for example, 40% and our sensors got disconnected. So we need, even if this happens, then we need to sort of act on that and do something about it. Um, and then each robot is a network, right? So as I said, modular uh, robots, they're built using a middleware operating system that is not just a monolith, 
but they have different components that go fail. So we're already in a single robot. We're dealing with a network um, of all those nodes, all those components of those elements. So for example, we have sensors, we have camera, we have um, joints and all of them like independent. They have that very often they're separate processes, uh, separate boards that deal with that. So um, again, we have a, already a network even within a single device. And um, final thing, their threat and their risk. Right, so the threat, because uh, especially the larger the robot, and if they have hands, they can swing hands, they can poke, and things like that. So they're not particularly sort of safe if something goes wrong. So we need to have mechanisms that, um, if something goes wrong in terms of software, the robot doesn't go wild and start, you know, swinging its hands, you know, around and jumps or falls or whatever that happens, and they're at risk. Right. So again, if something happens, it doesn't attempt to destroy itself or, you know, jump, um, you know, from a bridge or under, under a train or something like that. So if we need to have, so there are lots of failures, right? So from what you can see already, there are failures that some software, uh, you know, misbehave and they can be lost, right? The components may not behave, they can, you know, um, hit or hit themselves, somebody or themselves. So there are lots of uh, failures that we need to deal around um, with. So ROS, robotic has ROS and ROS is huge, right? So it's open source uh, robotics foundation that developed it and it's a robot operating system. It's not actually operating system, it's a middleware, but they have ROS and ROS is huge. Like it's a, it's a really, really big, it's like, Linux maybe in uh, distributed systems. So uh, it's around uh, from 2007 and it's a standard, it's an amazing tool. And the reason for creating was that is that no single lab, no single group or institute can handle the robotics, right? It's just too big, no one organization can do things, sensible things with robotics, right? So they decided to come up with middleware that everybody can use, everybody can, you know, quickly start with and then focus on their bits. So one of the elements of, uh, of ROS is that you can use as little or as much of ROS um, as you want, right? So you start with and then off you go wherever you want to sort of work with. So um, this is quite old picture, but this is the only sort of picture that Ross Foundation provides. So I just keep using it. I used it in 2015, I used it in 2022. Maybe when they come back, uh, come with a better picture, I will share a new one. But anyway, even this picture sort of demonstrates you that Ross is used a lot. And just to demonstrate how um, a lot it's used, um, the um, uh, Boston Dynamics, they have this amazing robot, probably many of you saw it, it can jump, it can resist, it's just amazing. And then they released um, a package, a ROS package, so that academics and industry who get by this robot, they can participate in open source, maybe not in open source, but in the research in developing something there. So ROS is this huge that, you know, companies like Boston Dynamics, they um, develop packets that enables researchers and other industries to use it. So it's a communicating tool and it's um, used to um, enable partners even who work with different middleware, different software to talk and develop things sort of um, that are available to everybody. So <clears throat> this is an um, overview of ROS and there is um, also ROS2. So I will just introduce ROS for now. So um, it's modular. So we have um, elements and each element has a node. So for example, we have a camera node that connects to the camera. We have uh, image processing node and they don't have to be on a single computer. They can be on different computers. And that's the sort of the demonstrate that they use um, PubSub uh, publishing and subscription. And if you're interested in certain thing, 
your um, you can subscribe it. So the reason uh, Ross is huge, right? So there is Ross too now, but it's not as popular because Ross just had lots of legacy and very well developed. Ross too makes uh, way now, but Ross is still huge. Um, and what it has, it has this master node, right? And all nodes need to be registered with it. And that's a single point of failure. Uh, the thing is that communication doesn't go through Ross node, but if you want to communicate with other nodes, if you want to subscribe or publish and other nodes to sort of subscribe to you, you need to be registered with Rosmaster. And the problem with that was that if something disconnects and you don't connect to Rosmaster, then the whole robot may fail, right? So just single sort of node that doesn't uh, carry much thing in it can take the whole thing down. So what they did, they introduced ROS2. So they removed the single point of failure and they um, replaced uh, communication with uh, DDS that is considered low tolerant, uh, reliable, and you can transfer lots of data with it. Then when we talk about reliability and fault tolerance, um, that's an interesting thing. And that's sort of the language that we need to be aware of when we come to another area, right? For distributed systems, uh, fault tolerance means that if something fails, we can quickly detect that that has failed and then uh, autonomously and automatically without human intervention, restart this thing, right? That's fault tolerance. And robotics, it means that it's fault tolerant if it failed and it doesn't prevent, uh, it doesn't cause the rest of the robot fail, right? So that's fault tolerance. And um, that's why we thought about Rosie, right? So, because this so sort of ancient understanding of reliability and we have so much more powerful tools in distributed system and that's why we bring it in. Um, so ROS has quite a number of limitations from distributed systems perspective. And one of the things, it was never designed for scalability and it was never designed for fault tolerance, right? It has a purpose. It's amazing for roboticists. It used the right tools. Um, white, um, huge society of roboticists uses it. And it's, it makes lots and lots of things right for them. Uh, but a fault tolerance and scalability were just never in the picture. Um, so then we came and we have two, for example, Erlang, um, that is scalable, that is fault tolerant, that was designed specifically for that thing. And Rosie is about tackling that exactly those things. Rosie, it's about remaining, leaving the nodes as they are in ROS, ROS2 specifically, right? Because we don't have a single uh, point of failure. So we still have this ROS nodes and all this sort of uh, breadth and expertise of roboticists that developed those roles, uh, nodes. But then when we do communication between the nodes, that's when the Erlang comes in and it brings uh, scalability, it brings ability to recover from failures and it brings hot code swapping. Erlan, yes. Um, so initial find, uh, findings were done in 2015 when I was a postdoc at uh, Glasgow University and I had an amazing, amazing student, uh, Andrea Lutak. And with her and uh, my colleagues from Glasgow University, uh, Phil Trinder and Girada uh, Aragon Kamarasa, we did this experiment just to see whether it will work. And what we had, we had um, recognition, and that's Andrea, uh, face recognition, and then we implemented two systems. So one was pure ROS as it is, and the, the second, another one, but with uh, sort of Erlang, uh, handling uh, communication there. But it was a very primitive, right? You couldn't actually use it. It was more for uh, just to experimenting. Is there a future in there? And uh, the, the main thing that we explored here is let it crush. So we implemented two systems. And as I said, one is Rose, one in, uh, in Erlang. If you're interested in uh, to have a look at the paper, um, it's, it's over here. And so what we've got here before this purple line 
is the system works, right? So it recognizes the phases. Phases, we have this number of frames and it just recognizes them. So it's, it's fine. So the, the thing that it goes up and down, it's absolutely fine. And um, uh, so here they're all sort of fine. And then we start introducing failures, right? And we have two types of failures. We have a soft failure, sending a signal, and we just have a brutal kill, right? And what happened is that with ROS, when even there is a 10% of failures, the robot just couldn't recover, right? It just eventually failed. It couldn't handle, handle with it. And when we uh, did with Erlang, even when we killed 50% of processes, it sort of troubled, like it was lagging, right? So well, by the failure, what, what we happen is that we kill process that handles it and it tries to sort of catch up and it's lagging and the, maybe your face is here, the frame is still here, then it sort of, it tries to catch up and it's sort of lagging behind and then it's, it, it recovered and it was fine. Right. So what we found that Erlang, it doesn't just reduce component downtime, it actually mitigates um, the negative impact of failure. So that um, in 2015, the paper was published in 2016, gave us the idea that yes, that's what we need to move on. So then uh, we um, Last year, as I said, we collaborated with the University of Milan and we've got our amazing Luca who started the implementation and he will talk, uh, tell you about the implementation. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you Natalia for this introduction. Um, basically, uh, one year ago, I, um, I was tasked with giving an Erlang solution to the ROS2 problem. So at the beginning, I started studying what we had to implement. And we focus on the client library, which is the core feature of ROS. ROS has many packages, many stuff, but the most important is the library for communication. So uh, here you have the software stack. And ROS2 uh, modernizes a lot over ROS1 because it decided to provide two bindings, one in C++ and Python, the, and then under them as a common layer implemented in C called ROS client library. And um, down there, you, you can see it has multiple RMW that stands for ROS middleware interfaces that lets ROS choose different uh, DDS implementations. And uh, basically to describe you the stack, uh, on the top you have language bindings. Language bindings are important when you have to manage the concurrency because each language uh, has its way to use threads and resources in the system. For, for example, um, for example, a ROS client uh, library in C++ uh, lets you plug in uh, uh, third-party libraries for executors. So let's, you can have um, uh, multiple ways to deploy threads and, and uh, have different scheduling queues for um, ROS messages, services, and actions. And the RCL layer implements the logic and is shared, so they save code repetitions. And uh, they basically don't care about the distribution part that is the most complex aspect. Of, so how actually data is replicated. So how do we send a message from this uh, uh, process on this machine to this other process on this other machine? on the network, DDS takes care of that. But when we, um, we come to implement uh, an Erlang solution, we want to use all the beautiful features of Erlang that Natalia just uh, introduced. So we need a fully Erlang implementation. We cannot uh, just call, we could call C code from Erlang and just use a piece of the stack. So we could just implement, let's say, RCL in Erlang, and then we use RCL and DDS. But we decided to go fully committed and implement an Erlang version of basically, let's say, the whole stack. So in the next slide, uh, Natalia, if you can uh, change, um, we proposed a more, that looks more simple, which is a good thing, because now you don't program an application on a library, 
but you program an application on other applications that are, you can see you have a LCL application uh, and then you have a DDS application and everything is handled on the VLA virtual machine. And this is a big plus because on the left, if uh, you have to think about threads, concurrency, et cetera, on the right, you have uh, applications that are a collection of processes organized in supervision tree. So everything is supervised, everything is under control. And um, that enables you to implement fault tolerance as described before. Uh, so I implemented the DDS app in the, in the past year, uh, of course, experimental version because DDS is huge. It's big, DDS itself is bigger than ROS2 because ROS2 uh, only uses a subset of the DDS specification. The DDS specification app that stands for data distribution service is managed by the OMG group, object management group. That is the, those are the same that manage the UML uh, specification. And okay, so uh, we can change slide, I think. Then by implementing this, of course, uh, uh, first requirement was to remain interoperable because it's useless otherwise. So uh, the most important piece of the software was to implement the RTPS um, library, which is the real-time public subscribe protocol that allows us to speak the same language of the native ROS implementation through UDP. So we are um, right now, and by the way, our code is open source. So you can uh, check it out on GitHub. And um, we are interoperable with RCL Pi, RCL CPP. So basically any uh, available ROS robot is able to communicate with us. And also all the visualization tools. So for example, RVIDS is a uh, tool that basically lets you visualize what a ROS uh, robot is publishing on the network. So you can see what he's, he's doing, but also other tools like introspection tools that allows you to debug the network. And the cool thing is that for the ROS introspection tools, the official tools, they cannot tell a difference between uh, uh, their official implementation and ours. So we are fully transparent on that field. And by the way, this uh, slide only talks about the communication but you have, to, you have to take in consideration that at higher level, data is transferred with messages. Messages are described and ROS has a custom language to describe these messages. So we also had to implement compilers to compile the uh, ROS language for messages in Erlang modules. And also we developed another plugin for the Rebar3 that is the development tool for the build tool for Erlang. Uh, that extends the build tool and allows you to put uh, ROS packages as dependencies of your Erlang application. So you can basically um, use the ROS package ecosystems, at least for now, just for interfaces. So you can basically pull the original interfaces, compile them and depend on them. So you can speak literally the same language at all levels with ROS. So you are fully interoperable. And okay, now, Code dot swapping. Um, basically, one thing I did with my thesis uh, was to demonstrate a cool feature of Erlang. So this is the scenario. Maybe uh, this is the a photo of the Perseverance rover. And uh, we thought, OK, but what if the Perseverance rover is implemented in ROS? OK. Uh, and the Perseverance rover maybe is running code that is vital to it for its survival. And uh, what happens if we spot a bug that is going to kill the robot and we need to upgrade it, but we cannot uh, allow ourselves to um, let the robot have a downtime. So we don't want to stop the robot. We don't want to stop the communication with the robot. Everything must remain stable while the robot upgrades itself because the robot is alone. We cannot go there and uh, remove a part uh, format some driver, no, nothing of that. So we need to save the robot and the robot basically has to save itself. <laughs> we just send the upgrade saying, okay, upgrade yourself. And we are going to demonstrate this. Of course, uh, we don't have uh, a rover on Mars, so we did it <laughs> on our PC. So before starting the video, I want you to explain 
uh, what you're seeing. Okay, in the top left corner, you have the Arvid window, which is the uh, which is the visualization tool. So Arvid uh, is from the loss distribution, and uh, is going to visualize uh, what our perseverance robin is publishing. So uh, my implementation basically is publishing messages regarding the state or what he sees. And uh, the visualization, visualization tool is configured to show that in a 3D scene. Um, also, one important note, the data you're going to see are two NASA data we took from a um, published bundle of the MEDA station, the Meteorological, Meteorological Environment Data Analyzer, I think. And so th those are two data from Mars. And on the top and on the bottom left corner, you have uh, basically the shell um, that is uh, running the node. Um, later, I will change to the other shell. Um, on the right, on the top uh, right, you have the basically the file system of the robot. And on the top left, you have the file that is the version 0.1 of the software. So right now, uh, what will be running will be version 0.1. 2.0 and we're gonna upgrade to 0.2.1 to fix a bug. So we can start the video. And uh, what you're gonna see now, uh, I should start the, okay. Basically I run the start script for an application. So I start in foreground, it's gonna start the, um, the robot process. And uh, our vids is going to subscribe to the topics of our robot and visualize them. And as you can see, there is a problem because the robot is bouncing around. Arrows that measure the wind are going up and down. The temperature is red hot while it's cold on Mars. So I'm going to create a directory for the app and to paste the directory. So basically I'm just transferring data and until this point is pretty standard stuff. We are basically upgrading a package with the new release. The release contains a fix, of course. I'm gonna start a shell and I'm gonna use the same script I used to start the robot right now uh, with another command. Instead of foreground, I'm gonna say upgrade and I'm gonna provide the version number I'm targeting. Um, by doing this, this script is another process, not a pro it's, not, it's not the robot process, but it's sending an, a remote procedure call. And on the left, the robot, as you can see, stabilized itself. So now it's not bouncing, it's going straight, temperature is blue, arrows are horizontal, as they should be because it's horizontal wind direction. And uh, basically what happened is that our script launched a remote procedure call that says, hey, it's time to upgrade. And who performed the upgrade was the, robot, the Erlang application that was running. Basically, the virtual machine that was handling uh, this robot. And it made it without lag, without interruption, downtimes, collateral things, no side effects. Everything went fine because we, of course, configured the upgrade procedure. We, we, I, I'm not showing anything of this. It's a, a bit uh, a complex procedure to explain. But uh, once you have the tag file ready, as you can see, it's a matter of instance a millisecond to upgrade, imperceptible, totally transparent. Okay, um, I'm done. <laughs> so I think... Uh, uh, Luca and time. Natalia, uh, we have just 10 minutes now, so when would be a good time to have questions and answers? Mm, right, so I'll go very quickly. So you've already heard about um, Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. And this project has been funded uh, by Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. So if you have um, work, interesting ideas that um, you think would benefit the Erlang community, please don't hesitate to get in touch, uh, submit the applications. You can find all the information on the website of Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. And if it's beneficial, if everything sort of meets, then um, your project will be funded, I'm sure. Um, another thing is Erlang Workshop. So if you have something that you've already implemented and it's interesting, it has um, academic insight, 
please consider applying to Erlang workshop. It's not just about Erlang. It's about functional programming. It's about anything that is sort of in any way can be related to scalability, fault tolerance, and um, BIM, Erlang, whatever, any languages. So there is a um, sort of dates, deadline when uh, for submission, presentation. If you're new to writing um, your papers, then um, the workshop provides support. So an experience academic can provide you support in writing your paper. So if you have ideas, please consider. Um, GRISP2, so this work has been done with GRISP2 and um, yes, that's, there it is, Luca is showing it. So please, uh, if you're interested, uh, they're available. That's the website and it's um, done, it's developed by Pia Stringsinger. And Erlang Solution is hiring. I'm sure Francesco already talked about it. There will be uh, more uh, Erlang developers. So if you're interested, uh, we have a number of offices. We have amazing A-class developers and um, knowledge of Erlang is not compulsory. So, um, that's it from us. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we'll be very happy to answer. Thank you, Natalia and Luca for sharing your experience with us today. And thank you, Natalia and Luca for your time.